Amen. Turn me to the book of Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Go down to verse 17. Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Go down to verse 17. When you got it, say amen. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Go down to verse 17. When you got it, say amen. Psalm 37. Amen. I ain't got it yet. Go down to verse 17. Before we get started, still got a hand clap. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Psalm 37, 38, verse 17. And it says this. Lord, I am ready to stop. And my sorrow is continually before me. Lord, I am ready to halt. And my sorrow is continually before me. What this means is this. God, I'm ready to give up. God, whatever I'm going through, I can't see a way out of this thing. I've tried all I can, and the more I try, the worse it gets. I, I, I worked hard. I, I, I did my best. And it's not good enough. In fact, the mistakes that I made years ago keep coming back to haunt me. See, the interesting thing was, this was David speaking. And, and David was a man after God's own heart. David had a whole lot of money. David had a whole lot of everything. But he noticed that as he was working hard, everything that he tried failed. And he wanted to give up. He wanted to turn away. He, he wanted to stop doing all the things he was doing. He, he, he wanted to build a house for God. And God said, no, you won't be able to build this house. The things that he desired, he didn't get. But he never turned away from God in spite of all the things that he went through. He never turned away from God in spite of all the troubles that he did suffer. But the thing is, he wanted to stop. What does that mean to you and I? Sometimes you will want to give up on the thing that you've asked God for. Sometimes you'll want to give up on the dream that you asked God for because everything that you see in the physical isn't working out. You, you look at it in the physical and it isn't manifesting itself. But here's the thing. Never give up on God. Never give up on God. Next, turn me, turn me next. Turn me next to some, the Psalm 38, 15. Psalm 3815. Psalm 3815. It says, For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. Next, turn me to Romans 15 and, and, and 15 and 13. We'll put it together. Romans 15 and 13. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 15. And 13. Romans 15 and 13 says this. It says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in your believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's translate that. When you're going through a dark space, when you're in darkness and, and everything that you try has failed, you pray that God fills you with hope. You pray that God fills you with joy. You pray that God restores you from the negativity that you're going through. Because the thing is, life is hard. The reason why David wanted to give up in the first place is because life is hard. He, he tried everything and it wasn't working out. And he almost lost hope. But then he remembered, I serve a God of hope. I serve a God of love. I serve a God who loves me regardless of what I'm going through. 
So he never forgot that God was the one who had hope. And as long as you have God, you have hope. And it says right here, Romans 15 and 13. Now the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? It says that God may give you peace in your believing. What does that mean? You go and do something and you can't see a way out. But here's the thing. You keep believing that one day you will get what you ask from God. You keep believing that one day you'll graduate from college. You keep believing that one day you'll get married. You keep believing that one day you'll buy a house. You keep believing that one day you'll get that job. You keep believing. See, the thing is, your hope is in your believing. See, the problem with a lot of us is we stop believing. We stop trusting. We stop dreaming. We walked away from the things that we asked God for because we said, God, I don't see it. And God says, you will have peace in your thoughts, in your beliefs. When I was sitting on the beach last night, tears welled up in my eyes because I said, how am I here with this woman who months ago hated the very breath that I had in my lungs? But as long as you believe, God will make a way. As long as you believe, God will open doors. As long as you believe, God says, it's not over till I said it's over. God says, as long as you have hope, I'll give you peace. As long as you have hope, i give you joy. As long as you have hope, you have a better tomorrow. You can't stop believing just because it's not happening right now. Because the thing is, God's ways is not like our ways. God sees high and he sees low. He knows things that you can't even think. And the thing is, God says, I have a plan for your life. Sometimes God is ordering your steps as you walk through pain. Let me say it again. Sometimes God is ordering your steps as you walk through disappointment. But the thing is, you never stop believing. You never stop trusting because God says, I will make a way for you in the middle of the things that you struggle with. Next, turn with me, turn me next, turn me next, turn me next to Psalms, to Matthew 27 and 50, Matthew 27 and 50, Matthew 27 and 50, thank you Jesus, Matthew 27 and 50, Matthew 27 and 50 says this, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, Yielded up the ghost. Verse 28. 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. I'm going to translate this. And the earth did quake, and the rocks did go to and fro. Verse 52. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which had died rose from the grave. Verse 53. And there came out of the graves after his resurrection many that went into the holy city and appeared unto men. Let me translate this. When Jesus died on the cross, it was a terrible thing. But when he died, other things came to life. When Jesus died upon the cross, when he died, those that were dead in Christ arose from the grave. They came out of the grave and they went into the city and everybody saw them walking around through the city. What does that mean to you and I? God died so that you could live. God died so that your dead dreams could come to life. God died so that you would have hope again. God died so that you would have love again. God died so you would have peace again. And the thing is, when you have this thing, everybody will see it. Because when he died, those ghosts came up out of the grave and they went into the city. Why did they go into the city? So that people could see that when Christ died, other things will live. What does that mean for you and I? God says, I have died for your sins. I have died for your peace. I have died for your dreams. Now it's time for you to 
to live again. Now it's time for you to live again. It's time for you to come up out of that grave. It's time for you to come up out of that bed. It's time for you to come up out of that mess and come back alive again. Because God died so that you can live again. Never let the devil trick you with death. Never let the devil trick you with failure. Never let the devil trick you with disappointment. Because the thing is, God knew that you was going to be going through that thing. But he has a way and a plan for your life that you know not. But all he asks, don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. You can't give up just because it's hard. You can't give up just because it looks like you're not making it. Because the thing is, God said, if you keep going, even though you can't see, I will open up doors that you can't touch yet. Keep walking because God says, I see you in the things that you're going through. I see you in the misery that you're affected by. Now turn to 2 Corinthians 3 and 13. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3 and 13. 2 Corinthians 3 and 13 says this. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end, which is the bodies. I will translate this. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. I'm going to translate this. Which veil is done away in Christ? Verse 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn unto the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Let me read it from the Living Bible Translation. We want to break this down. And it says, Not as Moses did, who put a veil over his face, so that the Israelis could not see the glory that faded away. Verse 14. Not only was Moses' face veiled, but his people's minds and their understanding was also veiled and blinded too. Even now, the scriptures is read, and it seems as though those hearts and minds are covered by a thick veil because they cannot see and they cannot understand the real meaning of the scriptures. For this veil of misunderstanding can be removed only by believing in Christ Jesus. Yes, even today, when the, book, when the Bible is read, their hearts are blind and they think that they are obeying the Ten Commandments in order to be saved. Verse 16, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord from his sins, then the veil is taken away. What does this mean? Let me translate this. Long, 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 long time ago when Moses walked earth, Moses had a veil over his face. A veil is like a curtain. Now, some of y'all see the Muslims walk around. They got all these shrouds all around them all the time. What those are called veil. And what would happen is you would put a veil over, over something that you didn't want people to see. It's sort of like in your house when you have curtains. And you have the curtains there so that people can't see in. The truth about a veil is it hides something. And here's the thing. Many of us have veils in our hearts. And the Bible says, because of this veil, when you read the Bible, it doesn't make any sense to you. When you read the Old Testament, it doesn't make any sense to you. And because it doesn't make any sense to you, you put down the Bible. You stop reading the Bible. You stop trusting the Bible. And the truth is, your hope and the thing that you're asking God for is in God's Word. So what does that mean? He said, but he says in verse 16, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. What does that mean? God says, when you start serving me for real, he says, the veil, the blindness, the thing that you don't understand shall be taken away. What does that mean? When you start trusting God, your dreams will start to come true. When you start trusting God, your finances will get right. When you start trusting God, he'll give you the secret to mend that broken relationship. When you start trusting God, he will open the doors of heaven and help you to get to the places that you thought that you'd never get to. God says, you got to start trusting me for real. He says, I'm tired of this old fake church business. He says, y'all need to start reading the Bible for real because when you start trusting me, I will open the doors that were closed before. Matter of fact, turn me next, turn me next. Turn me next to Isaiah 59 and 2. 
Isaiah 59 and 2. Well, why is it that the doors are blinded? Why is it that we can't see behind the veil? Isaiah 59 and 2. We're almost done. Isaiah 59 and 2. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 59 and 2. Isaiah 59 and 2 says this. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you. That he will not hear you when you cry out. See, here's the problem with a lot of us. A lot of us have sins that we can't shake. We have things that we like to do that put a separation between us and God. And what happens is, it separates us from us and the revelation that God has for us. What does that mean to you and I? Love lives behind the veil. Love lives behind the veil. Let me translate that. The Bible says in 1 John 4 and 8, God is love. But when we sin, he separates us with the veil. See, a veil is sort of like a curtain. He can see you through the curtain, but you can't see him all the way. What does that mean? You get a peek at your dreams. You get a peek at what you wanted from God. You get a peek at the things that you've been begging God for, but you don't get it all the way. Uh, it's interesting, this past weekend, uh, we were out in Cancun, and, and long story short, we was at a hotel, and they had Pepsi. But, the, but, but what they say is, Coke is the real thing. Pepsi ain't the same as Coke. Pepsi don't taste like Coke, but it's a cola. The thing is, God says, you have a Pepsi in your life, because you have a veil that separates you between the things that you're asking Him for and what you want to get from God. God says, start serving me for real, and I'll give you Coca-Cola. Start me for real and I'll give you the answers to the dream that you want. God wants you to serve him for real. But he said you allow these sins to separate you and him. What does that mean to you and I? The veil is also a thing that separates you between you and your loved ones. What does that mean? You have a relationship with a sister, brother, mother, cousin, father. Something happened. And whatever happened, it ain't the same as it used to be. The thing is, sin has come and broken up that relationship. I see it many times in my own family. I see it many times in my own house. Something happened and something breaks apart the family. Something breaks apart relationships. Everybody in this room has lost a friend or a loved one behind some drama. That drama is called the veil. And the thing is, love is behind the veil. But the thing that separates you is the sin. The thing that separates you is the transgression. Somebody in here hurt somebody's feelings. That's a transgression. And because you hurt somebody's feelings, now you and that person don't get along like you used to. Because somebody hurt your feelings, you don't love them like you used to. And the thing is, the Bible says God is love. So if you don't have love in your heart, you can't love God. Because God said, if you love me, you can't hate the thing that I created. Let me say it again. God said, if you love me, you can't hate what I created. Well, I hate my baby daddy. Well, I hate my baby mama. Well, I hate my best friend. I hate my daddy for what he did to me. I hate my mama for abandoning me. God said, if you have hate in your heart, you can't have love in your heart. Some of you need to forgive and you need to make amends for the transgressions of the pain that happened in the past. Matter of fact, turn me to Psalm 38, 38, 18. Psalm 38, 18. We're almost done. Psalm 38, 18. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 38, 18. Psalm 38, 18. Psalm 38, 18 says this. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. What does that mean? Some of us need to apologize. You've been walking around in pride too long. You, you and your sister don't even speak anymore. 
You and your brother don't even speak anymore. You and your father don't even speak anymore. You and your best friend don't speak anymore. Uh, I can't trust them. They did me wrong. What if God said the same thing about you? Look at how many times God forgives you. Uh, there was a passage in the Bible, and one of the disciples asked Jesus this. He says, how often should I forgive my friend who hurt me? And he said, should I forgive him seven times? And Jesus looked at him and said, no. Should I forgive him more than that? And he said, seven times seven. And the disciple walked away. What does that mean? God said, you have to forgive infinity. You have to keep forgiving. You have to keep forgiving, uh, forgiving, forgiving over and over and over again. Why would God say that? Because every time you get on your knees and you say, God, please forgive me for being in her DMs. God, please forgive me for overeating. God, please forgive me for smoking weed. God, please forgive me for having all this sex. But God, please forgive me for that abortion. God, please forgive me. Every time you ask God for forgiveness, God forgives you. Yet and still, when your friend or loved one or family member does something to you, you hold it against him. And here's the transgression in that. Love is in heaven. Let me say it again. Love is in heaven. Translate that. In heaven, there is only love. Only love exists in heaven. So if you have a heart that doesn't have love in it, you're not going to heaven. If you have a heart that has pain inside of it, you're not going to heaven. If you have a heart that doesn't forgive others, you're not going to heaven. Well, pastor, you a liar. My father raped me. I hate him. I want to kill him. Turn to Revelation 21 and 3. Turn to Revelation. We're almost done. Revelation 21 and 3. Thank you, Jesus. The book of Revelation. I, I, I can't forgive. That, that man did me wrong. I can't forgive him. He slept with my best friend. I can't forgive her. She cheated on me. Revelation 21 and 3. Revelation 21 and 3. Revelation 21 and 3 says this. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Verse 4, here to me. God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This is what's going to happen in heaven. In heaven there's no death, there's no pain. There's no crying. There's no tears. There's no remorse. There's no anger. In heaven, the only thing that exists is love. That's why God says, I am the judge. And God is not going to look at your actions. He's going to look in your heart. And he's going to look in your heart. And he's going to look for love. That's why God says, let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. You have to have a heart that forgives. You can't hold on to transgression. And some of y'all walking around and you still mad at something that happened to you. You still mad at a situation that you had no control over. And God said, you have to let that thing go. Because he says, it will separate you from my love. It will separate you from heaven. There's so many Christians that ain't going to make it to the pearly gates. Because they're going to get there. And God's going to look in their heart. And he's going to see hate. He's going to see anger. He's going to see unforgiveness. And God says, let it go. He says, let it go. And here's the interesting thing, how you know this is true. Everybody in this room knows of a story of somebody that died. And when they died, they said, oh, it felt so good. Every story that you see when somebody died, they always said, oh, it was an amazing feeling. Why does it feel that way? Because they know love. God is love. And if we don't have the love of God in our heart, we won't be with God for an eternity.
So God is asking some of you today, as he looks in your heart and he reads your mind, I need you to forgive that person. I, some of you, like me, I had to apologize to people that I hurt, that I hate, that I hurt, that I hate and hurt. I had to apologize to people that I did wrong and that done wrong to me. God says some of you need to apologize and some of you need to forgive. Some of you need to do both. Because we want the whole church alike to be in heaven rejoicing with each other. We don't want people to be separated because they had hate in their hearts. And the very last thing, Matthew 6 and 14. We done. Matthew 6 and 14. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 6 and 14. And this is all Bible. Matthew 6 and 14. Matthew 6 and 14 says this. For if ye forgive men of their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you of your trespasses. It's such a simple passage. God says, whatever you give, you'll get back in return. If you give love, you get love back in return. If you give mercy, you get mercy back in return. But if you give none forgiveness, he won't forgive you. And you want God to forgive you. Today when I lost my computer and I left it in Denver, that computer cost $1,700. But God says, I see the love that he deposited somewhere else. So he touched somebody and said, hey, pick up that computer. Hey, I want you to find this guy. Hey, put it in the mail for him. If God sees you doing what you don't want to do, he'll do for you what you can't do for yourself. God wants you to deposit love. God wants you to be forgiven. God wants you to let go of past pain. And it's not easy. But here's the thing. God did it for you. God forgave you. Some of you did some terrible things. See, the thing is, God has a camera. He sees everything that you did. But every time you say, God, I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. He said, I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. I will cast your sins into the sea of forgetfulness. God says, I won't even remember your sins anymore. So in order for us to be one with God, let go of the things that hold you down. Amen. Give God a hand. Clap. Hallelujah. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. Give God a hand for that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There is a veil between some of us and God. And a veil is a curtain that you can't see all the way through. Peter has dark tint on his heart. That's a veil. If you shine a light, you might be able to see in there. But most of the time, it's it. You don't want to have a veil between you and God. You want God to be able to, to see you and you to see him clearly. But the thing that separates us from God, the biggest thing that separates from us from God is unforgiveness. That's the biggest art, unforgiveness. It's not what you're doing in your DMs. It's not your weed that you're smoking. It's not your strange lifestyle that you have. It's the unforgiveness in your heart. Because here's the thing. Once you get saved, you can stop having sex with everybody. Once you get saved, you can put down the blunt. Once you get saved, you can, you can roll down the skirt. Those things are easy to change. But when you have an art in your heart, when you have pain that something that happened to you when you was a child, when you have the pain of something that happened to you when you couldn't protect yourself, that's a thing that's deep. That's a thing that stays with you for a lifetime. 
But the thing is, God says, I need you to take that thing out. I need you to remove it. I need you to forgive that thing. Because I want you in heaven with me. Because heaven is love. Heaven is only about love. But if you have anger, hate, resentment, unforgiveness in your heart, you won't be with God for an eternity. So some of you need to ask God, God, can you, can you work on my heart? God, can you help me to let this thing go? God, can you take the veil away? God, I, I, I want to get right. I want to get better. God, I can't do it on my own. Say that prayer every night before you go to sleep. Say that prayer every time before you eat. Say that prayer every time you read your Bible. And God will start to massage your heart. He'll start to break down the pride that has you holding that thing against that person. He will start to break down that anger that you have against the individual that hurt you. Because you need to let it go. Why do I say that? When you walk in pride, when you walk in anger, you walk in prison. When you walk in pride and you walk in anger, you walk in prison. You imprison yourselves and the glory of God can't reign in your life. Because you put yourself in this prison. You put yourself in a veil that's really a jail. And the thing about this jail cell, it's bars. You can see the other side, but you can't get to it. Some of you are so close to your dreams, but that veil that separates you from that college degree, from that husband or wife, from those children, from the things that you've been asking God for. So you need to ask God, say, God, I'm tired of this jail cell that I built for myself. God, can you open the doors and release me so I can love again? That's one of the most powerful prayers. Because most of our issues start with a relationship, either with mother or father, friend to friend, somebody like that. So we need, need to ask God to release us from the pain. Some of us are mad at God because of something that happened. Loss of a loved one. Uh, before I went on my trip to Cancun, I got two phone calls the same day. My father died, can you do his funeral? The same day. My father died, can you do his funeral? Some people are angry because they lost a loved one. And God says, can you forgive? You have to let it go. So the thing is, we need to ask God to remove the veil so you can go forward. Raise your hand if you have a dream. I still got a dream. I'm old, but I still dream. I dream every night. Amen. How many of you are really close to your dream? Raise your hand. You're real close. You got one, two, three, four. Oh, three. All right. So here's the thing. Ask God to remove the veil so you can get to the finish line and then you can start again. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Amen. You got to be worried when you wrap this up. Amen. Everybody grab a hand. Grab a hand. Grab a hand. By our head. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for coming to earth, for walking amongst us. We thank you, Father, for praying over us and covering us. We thank you, Father, for going to the grave for us. We thank you, Father, for removing the curses of sin by going to the grave for us. Squeeze the hand next to you. I squeeze life into this hand. I squeeze prosperity into this hand. I squeeze vision and purpose into this hand. I squeeze hope into this hand. I squeeze love into this hand. We rebuke the enemy, Father. We rebuke anything that's not of you, Father. Satan wants to destroy us with ignorant things, Father. We rebuke those spirits and those demons that try to control our life, control our families, control our finances. And we ask you, Father, to fill us with hope, fill us with love, fill us with joy, fill us with peace, and fill us with a better understanding to get you where you want us to go. And we ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah.